<clears throat> the dominant thing is uh, from the med medieval times, which well, sort of we're going to go back to unless things things really escalate into a nuclear war. Again, is is the power dynamic, and for that you need to have lineage, and then you have families which become patriarchal, and from there they dominate, and then they have a war warrior caste, and that goes on. Um, I. I I really hope that we're able to collaborate, but I think that it's it's going to be the people with force and power, however it is. Is it with technology or is it with skills or just plain martial prowess? Because that's how it's been all throughout the ages. And then it becomes more complex and then you have diplomacy and all that. But it starts with military might. That's how you protect your citizens, you protect yourself, you make sure that trade is, is enabled. You make sure that rules and regulations are followed, and then from there, everything else just builds up. Um, but again, uh, I might be wrong. I'm just raising this very sort of uh, concerning historical trend, which seems to be at play in most things. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, and and that's a good point. And in Europe, definitely the uh, the space pirates or the the warmongers have had a very strong entrenchment for thousands of years, and so that's if you look at European history, it really is a repetition of exactly that of uh, let's you know promote fear and anger and go to war with that group, and then you know once like. Um, that's the whole Indo-Aryan expansion. Um, and then once they got to, uh, say, the British Isles, um, then you had the Roman expansion. And then it, they were just constantly conquesting each other. Uh, however, you can contrast that with the Asian system, uh, which was much more stable. And uh, they had much less frequent uh, turmoils and uh, wars uh, between each other. And it was really much more about... Um, you know, cohesive organization and um, getting everything to work together. Like China, China is really, uh, it has a completely different history from the European history. It is not a history of wars. Uh, it is a history of organization. And then when the organization becomes <coughs> dilapidated or uh, kind of very old and non-functional, then you have a new organization take over. Uh, and then that that's that's kind of the cycle there. So so it, it's really much less about martial prowess and much more about uh, intellectual ability, uh, at least in Asia. Uh, and they have much bigger populations because they haven't been killing each other so much uh, as European history. I know that we could look up a map of the his of uh, historically recorded battles, and almost all of them are in Europe. Europe is just uh, extremely uh, under the influence of these uh, the space pirates. Like even now, they they had the most warmongers uh, in 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 the world. <laughs> okay. Anyways, uh, but I, I'm saying is that this is not a genetic problem. It's a it's a spiritual or a cultural issue, and it can be remedied. Uh, so it's okay. Okay, well, I hope, hope that helps at least a little. Um, and with the subsidiarity, it should give uh, enough um, uh, a kind of power at the lower levels uh, that you could have that kind of a more natural refurbishment of uh, the system. Uh, that, that, that's not based on bloodlines. You still have a kind of, it's democratic in a way, or it is democratic. I cannot say about Chinese history that much, and I'm not going to even pretend that I know European history too well, either just this is the basic general assumption that I think we all can agree upon. Um, regarding China, the only thing I think about is, is, is the art of war. <laughs> yes, that is a good that's a good example. And the art of war uh, basically says it, it's an, a set of instructions on how to avoid war, basically. <laughs> and, and like, you know, Go, like the, the game Go is also a good one. Uh, so have you ever played the game Go? I have not. Yeah. 
So it, it is extremely different from chess, which is popular in Europe. In chess, you, what you, you're doing is you're decimating and destroying the other side. But in Go, what you do is you capture uh, like usually around half of the territory. And then the other person captures about half the territory. And then you both agree that there is no point in fighting any further. And then you just count out how, how much territory you captured during the game. Every single game ends in a tie. And so it's a completely different culture because it's like, you know, it's not about destroying your opponent. It's about, you know, uh, knowing when to stop. <laughs> Because if you don't stop, then you're losing territory. Because you don't count the where you have the soldiers. You only count the empty spots in between them. So, yeah. It's... Um, I'm sure that the um, philosophy and, and cultural and societal, societal norms do vary. Um, that is obvious from looking at the human species. Um, however, the the act of conflict is sort of inbuilt in an empire. Uh, it's just the form of its function. Um, how many wars and, and battles happened in Europe and China or whichever continent then is, is a whole different topic in itself, just on the general premise of it. But I, I don't think talking about this is that helpful. I just wanted to uh, raise this uh, query. Uh, and I'm grateful for your response, Andre. You provide very good insights, as always. But I will let the, everyone else who has way more intellectual uh, vigor than I do to, to continue on this, this endeavor. Please. Go ahead, Ivor. Uh, hey, just remember what Plato said. Only the dead have seen the end of war. Well. <laughs> so so here I found the image and you know what's interesting is um there's that uh, another quote from Asia um and it is may you live in interesting times which is considered a uh you know a, a curse a curse exactly because most of the time it was fairly boring in Asia. There was no wars. There were no big battles. Uh, like here, here I'm bringing up the map. Of, these are all the battles ever recorded in history. Um, and now you have to remember that China has a 3,000-year-old history. And uh, Europe has only like two, two and a half thousand. But you can see almost all the dots. Yeah. But maybe, Andre, maybe that responds to your question that when you look back at the Chinese culture and you suggest that it's less bellicose than European culture, it's a matter of the maturation of the culture. It's also a matter of homogeneity. And when you look at the Chinese culture, if you look back, there, there, are, there are wars. There's plenty of conflict. It's not, I think it's, 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 not, it's not being really honest to suggest otherwise. And again, it comes down to... To, to resources and when you look at what's happening currently in china with regard to the uyghurs i mean they go back to attila the hun and they're they're suggesting there's an old beef that goes back thousands of years so you know it's even with the animals if you put a 50 pound bag of food in one place the two top animals are going to sit there and guard it if you take the same 50 pounds of food and you spread it out over 200 feet you can feed a lot of animals so, yeah. you know, you look at some of the cultures which seem less bellicose in nature, and is it, is, it a, is it a result of their homogeneity? Is it a result of their isolation? Is it a result of the fact that they have plentiful resources at the moment? And again, I, one of the things you've suggested in the past is cultures you've, you've pointed out that have been somewhat productive, it's because there's a very stringent code of ethics which is superimposed on the culture to control the culture through social mores. And I would suggest that that holds true in Chinese and perhaps other Asian cultures, which are more mature than, than most European cultures. So I don't know, again, I, I, I don't suggest that we can look at individual moments in history outside of the total trajectory and really arrive at any meaningful conclusions. Well, th this, this, I mean, this is the sum total from 2,500 years 
ago this image anyways but you're you're right that there there are some and and another good point you were saying about the the spreading out that food is um that in china generally they let people have enough land to uh, grow their own food and the main thing the government would do is is just have a tax on food uh and provide food um uh, occasionally i mean they had to fight off the bandits over here you see there's some dots um and so those they they would also conscript some people for that um but also they didn't that they didn't have like in north america over here and europe there's this kind of um uh where they think that warriors are a high class individual uh, but in China, I read this book about a 15th century monk uh, who went um, Jesuit or something uh, to China. Uh, and, and then he lived in Beijing and he, he was very shocked um, that at the time in Beijing, they, the lowest class of citizen was the military soldier. OK, sorry, uh, Steve, Steve, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think what you said, um, your your system is probably it's a very noble system, and it's probably the best for human beings to sustain themselves in a long period of time. It's best for their health. It's best for communities to get along, and all that is is true. The problem is, as we've we've seen in history there's this continued strife between good and evil. And I think what is gonna happen in the future, however the future unfolds, it's likely gonna be a combination of both. Uh, it, it, it's, it's been that way forever and it'll continue to be. So to me, it, it's, I think what you're promoting is the best for human life, lifespans, for human uh, living conditions. But unfortunately, we tend to short circuit ourselves. And I, I don't know why we do that, but that that's the MO. And so uh, a lot of people tend to follow the short circuiting pattern uh, and and then you get the conflict. But I think we're, we're going to move forward the same way we've been. And so uh, you're going to see a combination of both. So I, I, I do commend you for putting out that message, unfortunately. Uh, I, I think we will continue trying to scrape together in a peak oil environment as business as usual. Some people trying to work together better and some people trying to conflict, using conflict and, and uh, taking over and using military warfare. It's just going to continue to happen, unfortunately. Yeah, and and I, I would agree. I would agree that the general trajectories will continue. Uh, I was just talking about which ones to promote. Go ahead, Iver or ABC. Oh, thank you, thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, I just had a, want to have, ask a question regarding the map. Does it say what sort of conflicts are included? Are they skirmishes, battles, uh, how many casualties, and so forth? Just uh, out of curiosity. Battles. It says battles. Every battle in the last four thousand five hundred years. Uh, on Wikipedia, that Wikipedia mentions. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So the, then the definition of battle sort of comes into comes into play, but we don't have to go into the epistemology of, of that. Uh, and please, Ivor. Can I say something? Um, Sweden, for example, had lots of battles in the 16 and 1700s. They were all the time, they were getting in uh, fights all over uh, uh, Europe and uh, way down. And they decided to kind of, you know, uh, how many years has it been? It's been like four or 500 years. They have not been, they've been sort of neutral and not in most of these battles. And so uh, I think it is possible for a country to say kind of no to war. I mean, I lived in Costa Rica, it was probably the most uh, uh, civilized place I've ever lived where they kind of gave up the army and they just decided, okay, we're gonna try to make this place work, you know? And uh, I think, you know, so it's possible, but you also have to have a fortunate um, combination of circumstances. I don't think Sweden has much oil. So that kind of helped them out. But anyway, I think you have to be in this position where you're not, there isn't really too much that everybody else wants. And you have to have some resources to feed your own people. And uh, I think that's like a, a fortunate combination of 
circumstances that doesn't happen to everybody. Also, I read a book called Late Victorian Holocausts uh, by Mike, I think Mike Davis. And it's very interesting. Places like China and India both had huge um, reserves to get people through famines. And they would open up those reserves when it would when it looked like uh, things were getting bad, people were starving. And uh, along came the British, they took over kind of both places. That's it, Mike Davis, late Victorian Holocaust. And uh, they, the British kind of took over both places and they monetized that uh, wheat and all, and, and the um, rice and stuff. And they got it out to the port and turned it into money. So, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of uh, where we're at. We have these people who are sort of, we're gonna turn it into money. And uh, that makes for a pretty difficult situation, especially for the people who are actually living there. But you know, you have to have a big organized government that's gonna say, okay, we're gonna feed everybody. So I don't know, be nice. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point, uh, Ivor. And I've read uh, maybe not the same book, but a very similar book. And what they were doing with that money was that they were creating these little yellow dots over here <laughs> where they were ha having war in South Africa. They were exporting, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, they exported 50, uh, enough food to feed 15 million people from India. 11 million people starved to death. Um, yes. And then they used that money so that they could kill people in South Africa. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and meanwhile, they also keep up the opium trade. There was all sorts of fun stuff going on. But it was basically, you know, you had this organization that had been there for a thousand years and feeding people and pushing uh, food out to the famine areas. And then all of a sudden it was just broken up and let's get that stuff to market, you know, mm -hmm. monetize it. And uh, in a side note, in Canada and the United States, you don't see these big grain silos anymore because all that wheat has monetized. It's moved on to, um, you know, like, okay, a, a big place where you might see it is uh, Quebec City. You see a big pile of grain, you know, big grain silos, but that's to put it in the ship and send it somewhere. Anyway, little example. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I, yeah. I wanted.